Okay, so now we're going to talk about how we basically how we get CV, which is something you really need to know because you're supposed to. Uh, what are you supposed to tell me on Thursday, for your project? One is how much and how long, right? So we'll have a discussion after this whether you guys got time to do that by Thursday and what the consequences are if you don't do it by Thursday. It's really important to do that before you start the rest of the project because if you're doing that part wrong, then the rest of it's really, really wrong. So, all right. Um, so, okay, why are you not doing anything? All right, here we go. Okay, so now we're going to talk about lab testing. So, um, um, the, the, the good news about this is there's a really good section on lab testing in your textbook and it goes through the procedures really well. I still have, I've left in the Blackboard a um, chapter from my lab manual that I used to use for this section because the previous text we used wasn't very good in it and you're welcome to use that too. Uh, the procedure is essentially the same. There's some slight difference in the way they're presented. So you've got two different ways you can, things you can read and look at it, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, so I'm, I'm operating the assumption that everybody's probably done at least one consolidation curve and understands the, uh, one consolidation test and understands generally what's going on. When you take your lab class, you're going to do uh, you're going to do the uh, full consolidation test and all its great glory into doing all the loads and calculating all you know, doing the whole thing. So you'll get a chance to really do that right. So this, I'm not really purpose of this isn't for you to know how to do lab testing or know all the ins and outs of that. It's, but we're going to talk about the lab test so that you know how enough how to analyze the data and, and do your project and, and how to use the information. Uh, but to do that, you need obviously understand the typical um, um, deformation log time curves that you get and, and, the, and be able to um, generate the void ratio versus stress uh, curve. Uh, determine the preconsolidation stress for a given strain and uh, use, use Casa Grande's method. Um, and then uh, we already talked, we talked a little bit about Schmertman's method last time, but you, ought to, you need to at least understand how Schmertman's method is used. Um, I gave you some of my opinions about how appropriate or inappropriate it is to use that. You've got one of your consolidation, you've got, have you people looked at the consolidation data? Yeah? Yeah. So you've got one really good test and one test that you kind of wonder about. So you can decide whether you want to do any of these reconstructions on your one, because where's the good test at? Yeah, the good test is not where your uh, not where your embankment's going, right? So now you got a good test, but it's not where your soil is, and you got a test that looks disturbed, honestly, significantly disturbed, and it's on the side, you know. So you got to deal with that. So life's like that. I've given you all the data that was taken on this test, uh, and then finally, the most important part is be able to calculate CV given the consolidation data, and then. Um, we just discussed how CV varies with uh, your, your, eventually, you don't need to do this for this, for this current um, uh, exercise, but eventually you need, to, you need to plot the CV as a function of the effective stress and see how much it changes over the range of loads in this thing and, and pick a CV that's appropriate. Um, all right. So um, why do we do laboratory testing? Well, we just determine. <laughs> We, we, we use laboratory tests, one, to get, get the parameters we need to calculate the magnitude of settlement, and from that means we need to know C sub C, C sub R, sigma prime C, or, the, or the, what uh, Holtz and Kovacs called C sub C, C, C sub C epsilon, or C sub R epsilon, or we can use it to get the modulus, and I'm not sure I put the modulus in here. Alternatively, we can use it to get uh, M, uh, uh, as a would norm, I would say m as a function of sigma prime, and if it's constant, that's great. So, we, but we can use uh, a, uh, a, a modulus-based approach if we want to. We don't have to use the the uh, e log p approach. So, you guys looked at your you've got to look at your data. Which approach is most appropriate for the data that you have right now? Okay, so I got to vote for modulus. Is the modulus constant for the range of stresses you guys are working in? So there's, a, so there's a bunch of that need it. So all you, you got to do is take the plot that's there and, and, and click on the axis and change it from semi-log in, in Excel, right, to log, to, to arithmetic, and you can look at it in both spaces. It's very, very easy to do. But you guys need to make a decision about whether you're going to use a E log P approach or the modulus based approach. So you got to look at the data to make that decision. Um, the other thing we need out of the laboratory test is that information we need to calculate the time rate of settlement, and that's C sub V. So, um, 
Most often what we're going to do is one-dimensional consolidation test, which is uh, take the hockey puck of soil, stick it in the consolidometer and do it. Um, we could use, it, we, we do that because it's simple, and it's a reasonable model for most, most tests because most, in most cases the application is going to be for a fairly one-dimensional consolidation. And so in your case that's perfectly true, you're going to put a big embankment over this relatively thin layer compared to the size of the embankment and one-dimensional consolidation is appropriate. We can use triaxial tests and non-one-dimensional uh, tests. If you recall the, the data from Pinder et al. that we looked at from New Zealand was actually done with k naught consolidation, whether well, some test was done with odometer tests and some was done with k naught consolidation in a triaxial cell. So there's other ways to do that, but those other ways are most often research or fancy project ways. The standard way to do it is to do a one-dimensional consolidation test. So that's what we're going to look at. Um, I'm going to very briefly talk about devices. There's basically two uh, categories of devices. One is a pneumatic consolidometer where the loads are applied pneumatically. Um, they, the real advantage of this one is it's really easy to automate because you don't have to stack weights and stuff on it. Uh, and so you can control it all electronically in these days. That's a nice thing. And this is a picture courtesy of Humboldt of their um, pneumatic consolidometer. And the other one that's really, really common and the one that most people have experience with is the one we use here. And I, does, does anybody have a lab where they're using pneumatic consolidometers? Okay. The other advantage of them, by the way, is they don't take up as nearly as much space. You, yeah, you can put, I mean, you, you can put, uh, you can put half a dozen on, to, on this desk right here. It's, you know, that's really nice. Uh, so, but, and for automating, they're really easy. Uh, the, the bad thing about it, when the power goes out, <laughs> if you don't have a backup, you know, with, the, with your deadweight consolidometer, when the power goes out, if, depending on whether, if you got, you can, all you need is a, is a battery backup for your data acquisition system, and even if you lose part of a load, it's probably not a critical thing, but, with the, but if on, the, on the other one, if you lose power and you lose your air pressure and stuff, it's like you just lost your whole test. So that's one of the disadvantages of it. Um, very quickly, I want to go over the two types just so you know what's going on. I think you all know this. So we start, uh, we put our hockey pocket soil in a, in a water bath, in a ring. We got a soil sample. We got some confining ring around the outside that, that ensures that the, the, uh, the boundary conditions are one dimensional compression. And in a floating ring consolidometer, which is by far the most common, I and mean, we've already talked about this once, I think, um, um, we have uh, drainage on both the top and the bottom. So our drainage path is half the thickness of the soil layer. Um, got a loading cap on top. We've got some kind of dial gauge these days. We normally are using digital acquisition, but not always. Um, and we put a load on, and the dial gauge goes down, and the thing consolidates. So this is by far the most common type. Uh, the drainage path is half the sample thickness. Uh, and what we measure in this is the displacement dV is a function of time. That's what we're measuring in this test. We're measuring the displacement as a function of time. And we're not making any measurements of pore pressure. We don't know when the excess pore pressure dissipates. We're just measuring displacement as a function of time. The alternative to that is a fixed ring consolidometer, which we've seen a picture of before. This is a slightly different picture of the fixed ring. The big difference in this one, we have all the same uh, components, but the big difference in this one is at the bottom where we have a non-draining boundary at the bottom. Uh, so, uh, and this one it's shown as just as a solid non-draining boundary, but usually there's a porous stone all the way across the, the bottom so that you get the same pore pressure all the way across the sample. Um, so this is more of a conceptual drawing. But, the, but there's no drainage there, and you have some way to measure the pore pressure at the bottom. Most often now it's done with a piezometer, although you can put a standpipe in there, and the advantage of putting a standpipe in there is that you can actually do a hydraulic conductivity test during the during the consolidation. Um, before the digital days, it was just a little tube that went up there and you measured the pressure by watching the, the water rise in, the, in your uh, piezometer. A lot, today's often this transducer. This is less common. Uh, it's most often um, a research tool. In this case, the boundary conditions at the, uh, are such that the, the maximum drainage distance is the total thickness of the sample. Um, the nice thing about this one is we can measure both U excess and the displacement as a function of time. So we get two different measurements with it. Um, and we can also, I think, I hope this is the next, yeah, we can, we can perform a hydraulic conductivity test in this one because we can do a falling head test anytime we want. We can just, as soon as, it, as soon as it's consolidated, we just put water in a standpipe and we can do a falling head test. So it's a really nice way to measure hydraulic conductivity as a function of the void ratio. You just do your consolidation test. When the consolidation's over, you do a hydraulic falling head to hydraulic conductivity test. 
and then you go on to the next load. So those are the, these are the two advantages of the system. Uh, most commonly a research tool. Okay, so what's the process? All right, well, we put a sample in the cell, whether it's a floating ring or a fixed ring cell, that's the first step. We're going to take our sample, somehow we're going to get in. We're going to try and trim the sample so we get in there with as little disturbance as possible. It's better, uh, um, a lot, the standard practice around here lots of times is, ex is extrude the sample directly out of the sample tube into the consolidometer. It's better to trim the sample so it's a smaller diameter than what came out of the tube because then you're going to trim away the, the places where it's most disturbed on the edges. Um, that's not the practice in Southern California too much. We apply a very small load onto it we can't, uh, because there's a, the, the, we can't really apply zero load because we're going to put the cap on, we're going to do a lot of stuff, and we've got to put our measuring device on. So you generally we apply a very small load, um, and we call that a seating load. And we assume that as soon as we uh, apply that seating load, that that's, that's what we're going to call zero displacement because it's, it's basically impossible to measure the beginning of the test because we've got to put it all together, we've got to put the cap on, we've got to put, you know, so we put a small load on there and set everything up, and then as soon as, as, soon as we put that small load on, we measure the, the reading uh, right away, and we call that zero displacement. So the truth is, we don't actually know what happens at time equals zero. That's, that, that, that's important to understand. We really don't know what happens at time equals zero, because we only have a reading a little bit after that. Um, so we apply a load, and we take deflection readings as a function of time. So we're going to use these deflection readings as a function of time to calculate C sub V. That's what we're going to do with this test. That's part, that's one of the things we're going to get out of the test. I think the thing that's confusing about this test is there's really like a test within a test going on here. I'll try and explain that clearly. Um, the def deflection at the end of primary consolidation we can use to develop our relationship between the strain and uh, the effective stress. So we're going to get two things out of this test. We're going to get a measure of CV, and we're going to get our stress-strain curve. There's two different things. There's actually two different tests going on here. That's, what you, that's important to understand. We're going to measure CV, and we're also going to measure, get the data we need to do our stress-strain curve. So here's, how, here's what the process looks like. So this is going to be a plot. I'm going to plot both the vertical deformation and the excess pore pressure as a function of time. But in this case, I'm going to plot them as the log of time. And if I do that, um, in fact, if I, if I follow Tertsagi's theory, I'm going to get a curve that looks like this. Now, that curve doesn't flatten out completely, it flattens out in log space. Notice that if you look at this very carefully at this, you notice that it, it has some slope there. The only reason it looks like it's totally flat because this is log space, right? You know, if this was, um, you know, if this was 0 0.1 minutes and this is 0 0.2 minutes, right, then this is 1 minute, this is 2 minutes, this is 10 minutes, this is 20 minutes, right? That's getting flatter a lot of it just because the because of the uh, the log curve, right? Um, now what we actually see is something like that, and and that's secondary compression that's happening. In we're going to talk about that in a few uh, lessons when we talk about secondary compression. But we see that in the lab test. So we have to we have to understand that we're going to see that in the lab test, and that that's going to be important to how we um, um, analyze the data. Now, if I plotted the excess pore pressure as a function of the log of time, according to Tsagi's theory, it would look something like the blue line there. And again, it doesn't go to zero because how long does it take for it to get to zero excess pore pressure under Tsagi's theory? Infinitely long. It gets really, really flat, but it doesn't go to zero. And what do we actually see? Well, we actually see that it goes to zero, <laughs> at least as close as we can measure it. And so that point where it goes to zero is the end of primary consolidation. So to the left of that time, to the time shorter than that, we have primary consolidation. And the time after that, we have secondary compression. We're going to leave the discussion of secondary compression for another, for another lesson, but that's, but that's what's going on. Because notice that this deformation that's happening here is with how much change in excess pore pressure? 
Zero change in excess pore pressure, right? So if there's no change in excess pore pressure, what's the change in the, in the effective stress? Zero. So that's deformation that's occurring with no change in effective stress. So by definition, that is secondary compression. Secondary compression is, or you want to call it creep, is a deformation that occurs under constant loading. And for soils, constant loading means no change in effective stress, because it's effective stress is carried by the soil skeleton. OK, so that's what the curve looks like. Um, so let's just talk very briefly about secondary compression. We're going to talk about theory about it later. So the total volume change, then, as a function of time, is the change in void ratio as a function of stress times the change in, in effective stress as a function of time, plus the change in void ratio as a function of time. So the first part, I think I labeled this. So this is the primary consolidation. That's the change in void ratio as a function of change in effective stress. The change in volume due to a change in effective stress. And the secondary compression is the EDT, which is a change in volume at a constant effective stress. That's the creep or the secondary compression. So we have to find a way um, in this process to eliminate those two in the way we analyze the lab data. We're going to talk later about secondary compression, why it's important to know that, because if it happens in the lab, it probably happens in the field. But at least initially, to, to, to get our C sub V, which is which to, to understand where primary consolidation goes on, we need to get rid of that, at least in the way we analyze it. So we're going to take this point. What we'd like to know is this point where the excess pore pressure is equal to zero, and we're going to call that 100% consolidation in our lab test. So if we were measuring, if we had a um, a fixed ring consolidometer and we were measuring pore pressure, this would be pretty simple. We're just going to wait till the pore pressure is equal to zero. Bang, pore pressure is equal to zero. We're going to call that 100% consolidation, and that's great. We don't worry about the rest of it. It's secondary compression. At least we won't worry about it for right now. However, that's not the test we usually do. And even if we did, we're trying to figure out when this pore pressure here that's very, very low is actually equal to zero. So that's kind of hard to do. So that's not what we normally do. Um, now, I want to, before I talk about calculating CV, I want to put this, this picture that the test is actually a whole bunch of tests, that, that there's actually a test within a test and a consolidation test, because I think this is really important. So one of the things we're going to get out of the test is our stress-strain curve. And I plotted a traditional um, a logarithmic stress-strain curve here. Um, and what you have to realize is that every one of these points on the stress-strain curve came out from a log or came out from a, a displacement versus time test at a given total stress. Right, so I apply a load. Let's just look at this point. At this point, I, did, I knew what, what stress I was going to, uh, I was going to, I wanted to consolidate to this sigma prime. That's going to be one, two, three. It's going to call it sigma prime three, the third load cycle of this particular test. I applied that total stress onto the soil. It went into, uh, the, uh, Im immediately there was an excess pore pressure. And it, it, the settlement didn't occur immediately. It occurred over some period of time. Somehow through that test, I'm going to calculate D100 here. And I'm going to use that D100 to calculate the strain, and I'm going to plot that point. Right? Then I'm going to put another load on. I'm going to skip ahead two because there's not room to draw it. So two, two load cycles later, I'm going to apply another load. In this case, it's, I'm up to sigma prime 4. I'm going to get another plot of displacement versus time. <coughs> From that somehow, which I'm going to explain in a minute, we're going to calculate D100. And I'm going to get, get another point on my stress-strain curve. So there's two tests going on here at the same time. One's a test where we're going to look at the displacement. For, for a given total stress, we're going to look at the displacement as a function of time and try and calculate C sub V. From these tests, I'm going to get CV. And I'll get a different CV for each one. There's another one down here. I'm going to get another. In this one, I'm going to get another CV. And then, I, and then I'm also going to calculate the displacement at 100% consolidation. From that, I'll get a strain, and I'll plot a point on the stress-strain curve. So when you're doing a one-dimensional consolidation test, it's actually a test within a test. One's a time rate test, and, one's a, and one gives you stress-strain data. 
it's a test within a test. And I'm thinking, depending on what the next slide is, yeah, that's a great place to pause. Um, and we'll come back in five minutes. All right, so now we're, I'm just going to go through the procedures for doing this. It's well documented in your text, so, um, and you, you, as I said, you got another handout on this. So there's two methods for uh, calculating the uh, coefficient of consolidation. Um, the first one is called Casa Grande's method. In Casa Grande's method, we start with a logarithm of time plot of, a, so it's the vertical deformation versus a log of time. It's important to understand in this method that this is not zero back here. Oops. This is not, don't do that. This is not equal to zero at this point, right? Because it's a semi-log plot. Zero is a very, very long distance to the left. It's infinitely far to the left. You'll never get there. Um, so we start with the, with the data. Uh, we're gonna, the first thing we gotta do, so the very first thing we gotta do is we have to decide, since zero time is not on a plot, we gotta know what the deformation was at zero time, and we don't have a measure of that. So what we're going to assume, we're going to assume that the early part of this curve is parabolic. If it is parabolic, then uh, we're going to pick a point in this early part of the curve where it, where it has a nice curvature. It doesn't matter where it is uh, uh, specifically. And we're going to pick some point A that's on the curve, and that we're going to find the displacement at that plate, the location, D sub A, or delta sub A. The time at that time will be uh, T sub A. Uh, then we're going to go out of distance TB, which is 4 times TA. So we're going to go out 4 times as far in time. We're going to have a point B. Uh, at point B, we're going to calculate uh, 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 delta sub B, little delta sub B. The difference between those would be called delta delta. Sounds like a crappy fraternity. Um, we're going to go above the first time uh, delta, delta delta. Big delta, little delta. Or, or is it big delta, little delta? <laughs> However it goes. And that's going to be D0. So we're going to assume that that's, that's the, the point. If uh, we could have known what happened at zero time, that's what it is. Now, we don't know what happened at zero time because remember the way you do these tests. You got, you got some load increment that's done. You're going to go put a new load increment. And as soon as you put the new load on, so, so the, the, well, first of all, you're finishing up a load increment. The dial gauge reading you have right now is a dog gauge reading at the end of the previous load. It's really not the dog gauge reading at the beginning of the new load. It's a dog gauge reading at the end of the previous load. And as soon as you put your load on, what happens to the dial gauge? It starts spinning, right? Because that's when you get all your compression. Is right, you know, you get a bunch of it at the beginning very fast. And so by the time you take your first reading, it's sometime after T0. So you really don't know what the reading is at T0. A lot of labs take the reading at the end of the previous cycle and call it the reading at T0, but that's not really true. That's just the reading at the end of the previous cycle. You don't know what the reading was immediately when you put the load on. So this is what we're going to use to determine what the displacement theoretically is at zero. And this assumes that we have a parabolic curve in semi-log space. That's what that, that if, you, if you do the parabola, that's what you're going to, that's what you're going to get. So it assumes that that displacement curve is parabolic. <clears throat> then, that's a, so that's the first step. Then we're going to draw line number one. Line number one, we're going to go down where there's secondary compression. We're going to draw a line through the secondary compression or the linear tail at the end of the curve. And we're just going to extend that line out. Uh, and then we're going to find the inflection point, the point where the curve goes from being, where the displacement curve goes from being curved this way to being curved that way. Um, this is somewhat subjective, but it's not really that hard to find. You just, you, and it doesn't matter if you're a little bit off in this, but you're just going to look in the middle of the curve, find a place where it looks like the, the, the curve is changing the um, curvature from one direction to the other. Um, and then we're going to draw a line through the linear part of the center part of that curve. There's going to be a point where it's pretty linear, and we're going to draw a line through that. That's line two. And where those two lines intersect, we're going to call that D100. So that's all, I mean, that's, that's all there is. It's a very, very simple graphical technique. Uh, and you can do the whole thing in. 30 seconds, very simple. Now we've got to calculate C sub B. So um, we generally don't like, in general, in engineering, we like to calculate things in the middle of stuff because at the, at the ends of, at the beginnings of ends of things or at the edge of things, that's where, you know, you have bad things happen and, you know, where there's boundaries and stuff, you know, weird things are happening. So we like to get away from all the bad stuff happening. We're going to go right to the middle. So we're generally speaking, 
we find a point halfway between the, the, uh, the D0 and D100, that's got to be D50. And uh, then we're going to go over and find T50. That's pretty straightforward. And then we're just going to calculate C sub V. We know the time factor, we know the time factor for 50% consolidation. What's the time factor for 50% consolidation? I have to look that one up, I can't remember now. It's, uh, uh, was it 147, 0.147? Um, I know 90 is 848. Eight. Somebody look that up on that table real quick. What's 50%? Uh, maybe I have it on here. Oh, 196. <laughs> I forgot that it was there. I made you look it up and it was there. <clears throat> so we're just looking up at the table. Uh, what's HDR squared? That's a drainage distance. If so, if it's a floating ring consolidometer, it's half the height of the sample. It should be half the height of the sample at, n at this time, not half of the height. Not not if not if it's a one inch sample. It's, you know, it's not going to be one inch at the fifth cycle. So it should be. The, you should take it at the time that that was. And obviously, it's going to be an average over the over the. Um, um, it's going to be different at the beginning of, this, of, the, of, the, of the load than the end of the load. So theoretically, you want to go in there D50 and calculate that. If, it's, if there's a lot of compression, it'll make a difference. If there's a little bit, it won't make too much difference. And T50, that's the time we got there, and we calculate CV. It's that simple. That's all there is to it. Very, very simple. Uh, the problem is when your stress crane, when your, when your uh, I'm sorry, displacement log cur uh, time curves don't look like this. And you've got them all for your for your lab test. You can look at them. They don't all look like this. All right, yeah. OK. Um, and then if we want to know T100, that's that number down there. And we generally don't want to know T100 too much. Because again, that's at the edge. Where, you know, that, that, if, you have, if you have mistakes, that's where they're going to be. But T50, there's going to be less errors in. So, so generally, we calculate this as T50. Question? Well, that's a good question. What load do you check it for? Well, it's going to be different from all. So which ones would you check it for? Well, it would help if you, uh, the first thing you got to try and figure out is your soil normally consolidated or over consolidated. And if it's, if it's normally consolidated, it's not a lot of point checking this on the reload curve because that's not the behavior you're going to see. And then you can look at the, the range of effective stresses that you expect to see in the, in the material and pick it for a range that's in there. One of the things we're going to do is I'm going to have at least one group calculate CV for all the cycles and look how it changes as a function of time. Every, we're going to t we'll talk about this maybe on Thursday. Every team is going to have a little special research project to work on. And not really research, but a little special investigation to it. One of them is going to be to really look at how CV changes as a function of, t of, of stress and see how much difference it makes. So you guys are going to have to pick one. For the preliminary one, and, and, and it's not going to be the same for each one. So you, can, you need to do several. For the preliminary one, I just want you to pick, do, do one or two that, that look reasonable and pick one. Uh, but eventually, you're going to have to look at a bunch of them and decide which one to use. Because it's not going to be constant. OK. The other way to do it is what's called the square root of time method or Taylor's method. And there is a little theory behind this, which I'm, I'm not going to discuss. But we'll talk about the behavior you see. Normally, so, so now we're plotting. Vertical deformation as a function of the square root of time. Uh, so this one does have zero here, but if I was out here and this number was four, uh, what's the actual time at that point? That's actually two units, what minutes or hours or whatever I'm measuring. Um, in, in the good old days, we actually had square root paper, which actually looked sort of like log paper, and it had lines, it had the horizontal divisions that weren't uniform and had the numbers on it. But we just plot the square root. Not now, it's easier just to take the square root of time and plot it in a, on an arithmetic scale. But remember, the bottom is the square root of time, not time. So when you do this, usually there is a, a, I'll just call it a weird section very early in the loading. Uh, where the curve is normally steeper than later, but sometimes it's not as steep. And there's some things going on there, like machine deformations and some other things going on. Uh, and so we're not going to, we're going to assume that that's not the point of zero. What we're going to do is, uh, at some period after the first uh, few readings, you're going to find that the, the, the uh, square root of time, the deformation versus square root of time curve is quite linear. And it may be, It'll be different for every cycle. But you're going to find that section where it's really linear, and you're going to draw a line through that. And where that intersects, the, um, 
the axis, or in, in intersects time equals zero, that's going to be delta zero. It's going to be zero displacement. And you're going to ignore those first few points, because there's scattering and there's issues there that, that's not always linear. And then at the end, it's going to be extended out, obviously. So um, then we're going to pick a point A, any point, doesn't matter what it is. We're just going to pick a point on that line. Um, then we're going uh, to measure the distance along to A. I'm going to call that XA. That's X. That's not time. That's square root of time. So th don't convert this into time. Just slap a ruler down on your plot of the square root of time versus deformation and measure that distance. So I usually actually pick a point that's you know, a nice even number on my ruler because it doesn't matter where you do it. And then we're going to go out a distance 115% uh, of that. We're going to pick a point B such that um, the distance from the uh, axis uh, from the, the distance from zero time axis to B is 115% of uh, XA. So we're just going out 115% uh, of that. So we're just doing this to draw a second line. You can pick any point you want. So I always pick a convenient point. And then we're going to draw a second line through point B back through the origin. So that, that whole exercise was to get a line that with a slope that's that's uh, 150, it's 15% less than the slope of the other line. That's, that was the whole point of that exercise. So you can pick any point B that you want. So just pick a convenient one. Don't, don't pick it too far high up because the, the, the dif difference isn't going to be very big. You know, the, the farther down, the, the lower you pick it, the bigger the difference, the easier to plot it. Uh, but it, the point is arbitrary. The point where that line intersects the curve is D90. We're not going to get to D100 necessarily in this curve. We may or may not. But, but the, that, that point is D90. Uh, so now that we know what D90 is, we're going to do, do something similar to um, that we did before. The time then is, uh, that we read it off the axis, is obviously the square root of T90. So um, there's two ways to, um, um, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Uh, if we wanted to know D100, um, we could just, if we know what D90 is, we know what D0 is, then we can calculate D100 is just D90 minus D0 divided by 0 0.9. That's going to be D100. Um, and uh, we could calculate um, D100 theoretically. We don't normally do that. But now we're going to go to calculate CV. There's two ways to do it. One, one way we can calculate CV is knowing um, T100. And we can calculate it use I'm sorry, T90 and calculate using 290. I usually prefer to go back to the middle of the plot and calculate D50 and calculate T50. So D50 is just 5 ninths of D90 minus D0. Uh, some people actually split the distance halfway between and calculate D45. You could do that, too, if you wanted to. Um, but I like to go in for T50, uh, calculate D50, or, uh, figure out what D50 is. And from that, you're going to calculate T50 or read T50 off the plot. And then we're just going to calculate CV is equal to T50 over HDR squared uh, divided by T50. So there's two other variations on this. You can, instead of doing that, you can, uh, you can use, instead of this, if you want to, you can use T90 uh, HDR squared over T90. So you can just come in with a value at, T, at uh, you can, your T90 value and put the time factor for T90, which is 848, I think. Is that right? Some people also, uh, because it's a little easier, they just split the difference between here and here and go halfway in between. And that's going to give you D45, because you can calculate these two distances. That's easier to do with a ruler. And then you come, you, that's D45. Then obviously, this is the square root of T40. Let's see if I can write that more carefully. The square root of T45. And then you can, cal you can do the calculation as big T45 times HDR squared divided by T45. So you can do it any one of those three ways. doesn't matter. I think it's really common to do T90. Anybody, have, anybody do this in the lab regularly? OK. So no input from the field on this one. I, I, I've always used D50, and I've heard from other people. They never do that. They always use D90, so I don't think it really matters. So those are the two methods. There are some advantages to this one. So, and there's some advantages to the other one. 
What's one? Of, what's a big dis disadvantage? You guys see a big big disadvantage to um, Casa Grande's method? Whoops, I gotta go back this. I don't want to go back that way. I want to go back this way. Whoops, that's not the one I wanted either. So what's a big big disadvantage of using Casa Grande's method? How do we find T1, D100 in this one and T100? We, we, we got to draw th this line, and we got to come and draw this line. How do we get line one? What do you have to do to get line one? We have to wait for it to go into secondary compression, right? And how much time is there out there in that end of the log scale? A lot of time. For this one, you have to wait for it to go several uh, you know, two, you, have, you have to wait for it to go two to four times past um, D, uh, T100 in order to get the slope of that line. And what about Taylor's method? We don't even have to wait for T100. All we need is, D, all we need is uh, D90. So that in this one, we actually can predict when T100 is going to be. So that, that one of the big advantages of Taylor's method is it doesn't take, you don't have to run the test as long, because we don't we really only want to get to 100% consolidation. We'll talk later about why going past 100% consolidation. But what's an advantage then of, 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 a, of a Casa Grande's method in, in terms of the tail end of the curve? Yeah, if we need second, we're going to we'll talk about it. If you need C sub alpha, which we're going to talk about later, if you need the secondary compression index, you got to do that. So. That's kind of the, the, the real disadvantage and advantage of the two is all related to secondary compression. One, you got to wait for it, and the other one, you don't. And one of them, you can get it, and the other one, you can't. So I think you'll find in the, I forgot what I gave you in the, did I just give you the raw consolidation data in the E log P curve? Is that what I gave you? Yeah. They, they give you the curve, right. They give you the plot. Right. So, um, and, and it's very common for people to plot both like that. I did take the results off, the, their computation of C sub V off there. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, log time method takes the most time, but uh, and because we, we must run the test past T100, that's what I just said, right? Um, but we can calculate C sub alpha, which we haven't talked to yet about, but that's the the secondary compression index, which we're going to need to know if we want to calculate secondary compression. Um, with the square root square root of time method, it takes less time because. We, we only need to run the test at T100, and we can actually predict when T100 is going to come, so we know exactly when to stop the test. Uh, so that's nice. Uh, but we can't com compute C sub alpha. So those are the big differences. It's actually very, very common just to run a test for 24 hours and not worry about that. Uh, but we'll talk about what the good and the bad of that a little later. <coughs> 